Good evening, everyone. If I can quiet the crowd, please. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm John Podesta. I'm the president of the Center for American Progress. It's a great honor for me to be here with this uh, great panel. And on behalf of the American Constitution Society, I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to tonight's plenary pa panel, which is entitled The Levers of Change, How Progress, I like that term, How Progress <laughs> is Made uh, in Today's Policy Environment. Uh, I'd also like to extend a special thanks to all of our uh, panelists who have been generous enough to donate their uh, valuable time to participate in this uh, discussion. Uh, we have several members of the administration uh, up here, and given the pace of the new administration, I think spending a Friday evening doing anything but being in a catatonic state is, uh, <laughs> is really an heroic effort. Uh, but I know that uh, the panel will be lively just as a, uh, by way of uh, one piece of house keeping business, you're going to get to ask most of the questions tonight. And in order to do that, you have to reach into your bags and pull out cards and write those questions uh, on cards. And then they're going to, the uh, people will collect them and, and, and give them to me. So uh, if you don't have a card, some people on the outside, the, the, some of the staff have cards in, or just write it on a piece of paper. Uh, but I'm going to, uh, I want to just set the stage briefly for this panel. Uh, change is a word that we've heard uh, over and over again during the past few months. We heard a lot of it uh, during the course of last year's campaign, and I think for good reason. Uh, in November last year, after eight years of conservative leadership, um, I really wanted to say failed conservative leadership, but they told me to pull my fangs in tonight, so I'm going to try to do that. So <laughs> after, after eight years of conservative leadership, the uh, American people went to the polls prepared uh, to send a clear, decisive message uh, that they were ready for a shakeup in Washington. Uh, the election and the inauguration of President Obama reflects, uh, really, I think, a sea change in politics and policy uh, at the, in the federal government. And I think it mirrors a fundamental shift uh, in American attitudes. Uh, our country has become more progressive on a variety of key political and social issues. Uh, research done by the Progressive Studies Program, which is a project of the Center for American Projects, shows that there's now broad support for a number of progressive priorities, for example, 80% of the electorate agrees that there's a need for uh, more environment, environmentally sustainable lifestyles. 79% agree that uh, there needs to be government investment in education, infrastructure, and science. 65% are looking uh, for guarantees for affordable health coverage for all Americans. And I think the polls that just came out uh, in the Wall Street Journal and the, uh, and the uh, CBS and the New York Times kind of mirror that. Uh, on a, a macro level, the change uh, in popularity popularity level uh, in the progressive label over the past several years serves as another bellwether. Uh, today, 67% find the term progressive to be favorable. I think that's part, partly because President Obama tends to talk about progress and, and being a progressive, uh, but that was up from 42% in 2004, uh, now tying the term conservative. Uh, so I think we've seen a momentum shift uh, not just in policy, but in, in the public's perception of what needs to happen in the attitudes of American voters as well as the leadership in Washington. And that's created a host of opportunities and challenges uh, for policymakers. Uh, from the $787 billion uh, recovery and reinvestment bill that was passed 25 days uh, into the president's, after the president's inauguration, uh, a wide variety of executive actions that hopefully uh, we'll get to tonight the legislative battles that are currently taking place uh, on Capitol Hill, uh, to the nomination of a new Supreme Court justice. Uh, we're seeing how these prospects and uh, problems influence how uh, we make uh, pr progress. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about this evening. We'll explore how these levers of change have shifted, how those shifts will influence the way we operate in a new policy environment. Our panelists this evening represent expertise in a wide a uh, range of fields that encompass this topic. And I once again uh, like to thank them for joining us. I'm going to give them introductions at the front end. Then I'm going to begin by asking uh, in turn uh, to uh, each uh, panelist to, to, to say a few words. But I'm going to try to steer this a little bit by asking them a question at the front end. But let me do the introductions first. Uh, Lisa Brown is very well known in this crowd. Uh, she serves as.
she now serves as assistant to the president and White House sec uh, staff secretary, a position I occupied in 1993 for President Clinton, so I expect her to be the chief of staff in the White House in the last <laughs> two years uh, of the Obama uh, administration. Uh, she co-chaired the agency review uh, for the Obama-Biden transition project. We got to work uh, extensively together on that. Prior to joining the transition, she served, as you know, for six years as the exec executive director of the American Constitution Society, where she helped lead the organization to the tremendous growth uh, and prominence that it, that it has today. Uh, Lisa also was counsel to Vice President Al Gore and a member of the executive board of the President's Committee for Employment of People with Disabilities. Before her duties in the Vice President's office, uh, Lisa served as attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice, so she's seen the law from a, a variety of different perspectives. Uh, Ron Klain, who's uh, sitting uh, to Lisa's left, uh, currently serves as the assistant to the president and chief of staff uh, to Vice President Joe Biden, a position he knows well from serving as chief of staff to Vice President Al Gore. Uh, before joining Vice President Gore's staff, Ron was chief of staff to the Attorney General Janet Reno and associate counsel to President Clinton in charge of judicial selection. Uh, uh, Mr. Klain has been a veteran of five presidential campaigns. He directed the fall debate preparations for uh, President Obama as well as for John Kerry in 2004. Uh, in 2000, he served as general counsel uh, to Vice President's Recount Committee in Florida, uh, a role made slightly more famous by Kevin Spacey. Um, <laughs> on, on Capitol Hill, he served as the staff director for the Senate Democratic Leadership Committee and Chief Counsel to the uh, U.S. Senate Committee on the Judiciary for then-Senator Joe Biden. Uh, Noel Francisco uh, defends companies and individuals in civil and criminal litigation uh, involving federal and state governments, including enforcement actions brought by government lawsuits against governments and in congressional investigations. Mr. Francisco advises clients on Exxon Florio reviews before the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, so-called CFIUS, uh, committee, and he's a recognized authority on constitutional and national security laws. Uh, in addition, Mr. Francisco advises individuals and companies subject to congressional investigations, such as the International Coal Group in connection with the 2006 Sago mine accident. Uh, perhaps more importantly, for the, for the perspective of this panel, he served as the associate counsel uh, to President Bush from 2001 to 2003, and then the deputy assistant attorney general in the Office of Legal Counsel, uh, from 2003 to 2005. Uh, Spencer Overton is the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Policy at the Department of Justice. Uh, he's currently on leave from a position of Professor of Law at the George Washington University Law School, where he specializes in the law of democracy. Uh, Mr. Overton was a commissioner on the uh, Carter-Baker Commission on Federal Election Reform. He chaired the Government Reform Policy Committee for the Obama for America presidential campaign and he served on the Obama-Biden tra uh, presidential transition team. Uh, he, uh, Spencer was an associate counsel in the office of the general counsel, chaired the election assistance uh, commission agency review team, and served on the technology and government reform team. Uh, we didn't really actually have very many uh, uh, people in the transition, so Spencer took on 12 roles. Uh, he's also a former board member of the American Constitution Society. And finally, uh, Preeta Bansell's career has spanned government service and private practice. Uh, is she's currently the general counsel and a senior policy advisor at the Office of Management and Budget uh, in the Executive Office of the President. At OMB, uh, Preeta works on issues regarding the preparation, supervision, uh, and administration of the federal budget for executive branch agencies, as well as the coordination of the administration's procurement, financial management, information, and regulatory policies. Uh, before joining OMB, uh, Preeta was a partner and head of the appellate litigation group at Skadden Arps, uh, Slate, Meager, and Flom uh, in New York. She was the Solicitor General of the State of New York, uh, special counsel in the Clinton White House and Justice Department, and law clerk to the U.S. Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens. She also headed up uh, in the transition uh, the role of, uh, uh, of picking and putting lawyers into the administration. So if you've got any beefs about that, you can see her after the, <laughs> after the, uh, after the panel. Um, uh, but we had a, a great chance to work together during that time. We were to have Greg Craig uh, on the panel tonight. You know, it's tough in the White House, in the White House Counsel's Office, particularly over the last five and a half months. He's not yet in witness protection, uh, but he did. <laughs> 
he did uh, it come up. Uh, he had an unavoidable conflict, so he w uh, won't be uh, with us uh, this evening. So I regret that. But um, uh, he's with us in spirit. So let me start. I'm going to start uh, in honor of her role as the former uh, executive director of the American so Constitution Society. I'm going to start with Lisa. Um, uh, and I want to ask you a two-part question. They have nothing to do with each other. Uh, first part is you've been the executive director of the American Constitution Society, and you've been now the White House Staff Secretary. We know which one's harder. You have to answer which one's more fun. And, <laughs> and when you're done with that, um, uh, last year, I think, at this, at this conference, I think if you uh, asked anybody in the audience, there was probably uh, everyone uh, assumed that if uh, a Democrat was elected president, if President Obama was, a, was uh, elected to office, he would close Guantanamo. Uh, he's pledged to do that. That seems to be somewhat more difficult, and you might want to reflect a little bit on, on why you think uh, uh, the, there's been so much resistance to that, uh, particularly on Capitol Hill. Uh, but I think uh, most of the people in the room would have thought uh, that he might have abandoned military tribunals in favor of, uh, in favor of moving uh, the prisoners at Guantanamo through the, through, uh, the criminal justice process, through an Article III court, or through the uh, Uniform Code of Military Justice. And um, now that you're in there really grinding and working on those issues, I know uh, you, I would have asked this to Greg, but Lisa, I know you've been involved with it. Uh, explain a little bit about, the, uh, about uh, why the president chose to stick with uh, military tribunals as, as at least one venue for, uh, for, for trying the, the Guantanamo uh, prisoners and, and how the, uh, dealing with, the, with this basket of very tough national security problems is uh, has been for, for the White House. But you've got to answer the first question first, which is more fun. Uh, first, I just have to say it's amazing to be here, and it's amazing to be on this side of the microphone. Um, it's <clears throat> the first time I've done it, and I, I, I now think I should have done it before because I look at these lights that mean I can't see everybody very well. Um, it is really terrific to be here, and um, it's, I, I consider it an honor, actually, to be here. And more fun... Um, they're both spectacular, both spectacular, and, and, there, and there's no question that everything the everything I did with ACS has, in many ways, um, helped prepare me for what I'm doing now. And the breadth of the issues that ACS covers, the all, which I care passionately about. I mean, it's not surprising that I've ended up doing working somewhat with counsel's office because it is the issues that I care about so much. Um, but the the people that I met working with at ACS, um, a lot of it has really transferred because it's people that I'm working with now and. The administration and from Spencer and Ron and Preta and John. I mean, these are all people who um, were part of the ACS family before. So I feel like it's actually, it, it's just continuing it um, and feel very, very lucky to be able to do that. Um, I think the hours are worse in this job. I'll say that. <clears throat> um, Guantanamo. Um, the president, as I think everybody here knows, um, cares very, very deeply about closing Guantanamo, about ending torture. I mean, if, when you think that what he did when he came into office in terms of the early executive orders on saying no torture, I'm closing Guantanamo, we're going to look at each of the detainees and figure out who can be transferred, who can be released. We want to try people in Article Three courts. I mean, what he has said very clearly is he, where practicable, um, he wants to be trying people in Article Three courts. And that presumption all on its own is a big change and is working with the, the Justice Department is working very hard. There's a task force now that is evaluating each detainee at Guantanamo and determining who can be tried in Article Three court, who can be transferred to uh, another country, can be released and transferred. Um, and there's a huge amount of thought that is going into this. And military commissions, he feels is there, there is a, a place, a narrow place for them, but there is a legitimate role for military commissions um, in a time of war. But he's also made very clear that they need to be improved upon. And he, there are already a number of administrative changes that he has um, ordered that, engage, that involve um, no introduction of evidence of statements that, have, that were obtained by um, use of torture, that you have a greater choice of counsel, that the burden of proof on hearsay evidence is now 
on the government if they want to introduce the hearsay evidence instead of on um, the detainee. And he wants to work with Congress on actually making even more changes. So another change that you see is really engaging and working with Congress on a number of these very difficult issues. And um, specifically on military commissions, this is an area where we're in the middle right now of figuring out exactly what it is that, what the changes are that we'd like to see and on uh, working with Congress on that. Um, I think the, it's, the, it's become a more political issue, as John, as you recognize, with, with, with the Capitol Hill. It's, a, you know, it's, it's not always easy when you're trying to resolve some of these issues. And it's an ongoing conversation with the Hill about um, pre bringing people into this country to be tried. And you know, I think we've just done that um, with Galani, who was transferred to the Southern District of New York to be tried recently. Um, and it's, I think that the conversation with the Hill will be an ongoing one. It's really hard. Uh, I have to say, it's not, I, having worked with Vice President Gore, and one of the things that um, when he gave a speech for ACS actually several years ago, we, a number of people from the prior administration came together and, t and talked through a number of these issues. And on a lot of the national security issues, there isn't, it's not as though people are in extreme different positions. There's a, there are certain fundamental differences over it, things like what constitutes torture. But on a lot of these issues, I think everybody's really in it trying to do the right thing, trying to protect the country. I think we're, there's a, there really is on the military commissions in Guantanamo a desire to have the really have the rule of law um, apply. But I, I think everybody is really trying to, trying to figure out how to do this as best they can. Uh, no, you served in the, um, I'm having a little trouble with my mic. Can we bring it up? OK. Is mine on? Okay. Yeah, I think I think uh, I think they're trying to bring them up and down. Uh, you served in the Office of Legal Counsel uh, at a time that's generated great controversy from 2003 to 2005. A uh, number of opinions of, of the office were withdrawn by the uh, by the Bush administration right before they uh, left office. There's now a review of some of what went on at that time. Uh, but I want to ask you to follow up on Lisa uh, of uh, on what Lisa said. Uh, as you look at the way President Obama has handled these cases in particular, what, what have you agreed with? What have you disagreed with? Uh, what surprised you, if anything, about uh, the approach that the administration has taken, particularly on, the, on this basket of cases on torture, on sure. Guantanamo, on, on uh, how to prosecute the, the people who are currently sure. being held? Well, I'd like to start out with something that I completely agree with Lisa on, and that is... Uh, regardless of which administration's lawyers you're looking at, these lawyers are always, always, in my experience, trying to do the right thing, struggling with very, very difficult legal questions. Take the torture issue. There was no lawyer in the United States government that was roving around the world trying to push on others various practices. Rather, when you're a lawyer in the Office of Legal Counsel, a question is brought to you. The question is, can I do this or can't I do this? Whether it comes to things like stress positions, whether it comes to putting a caterpillar in a box with a man and letting the man think that it's poisonous, or even when it comes to the waterboard. So this question comes to the lawyer, and a lawyer is faced with a, a really a, a horrible decision, a decision that no matter how he decides it or she decides it has horrible consequences. If you come to the conclusion that it's not torture uh, or that it is torture, then you are potentially preventing the government from finding out uh, information that could thwart a, a second terrorist attack, another September 11th. If you come to the conclusion that it, that it uh, is torture, then you're authorizing government officials to do what I think everybody rightly cringes at, uh, pretty bad things. Either way, it's a bad decision, but these lawyers are forced, forced to make this decision because that's their job. They've got to decide it one way or another. And that's, I think, what the lawyers uh, in our administration did. And I, and I hope that you all will never have to confront those decisions, but uh, they may be questions that you have to face. When it comes to how the president has addressed a lot of these issues, and in particular when it comes to the military commissions in Guantanamo Bay, I think the president is confronting an issue that uh, President Bush confronted as well. Uh, I think most people and most members of the administration eventually came to the conclusion that we'd be better off without Guantanamo Bay. The problem, though, is how practically can you shut down Guantanamo Bay? You've got a bunch of very, very bad people. 
There may be some subset of them that can be criminally prosecuted, but I can guarantee you that there's also a a subset of them that can't be criminally prosecuted. And they can't be criminally prosecuted either because the evidence that you have them against them would be completely inadmissible uh, in an ordinary criminal proceeding. Or perhaps they actually didn't commit a crime. When you hold uh, somebody who is engaged in war, they didn't necessarily commit a crime. They're engaged in combat against a country. And traditionally, prisoners of war in a traditional war, unlike the w- ones that we've been fighting, weren't criminals. Uh, They were warriors. And as warriors, you had the right to hold them, but you didn't have a right to criminally try them because they didn't necessarily violate a law. So what do you do with that class of people that you can't criminally try? Well, you can have military commissions for the ones that you think committed crimes because that's what a military commission does. It's simply an alternative forum for trying somebody for committing a crime. But what about the ones that you really don't have any admissible evidence again, or the ones that, frankly, you don't think committed crimes, but nonetheless are uh, people that if you released, you're pretty sure would pick up arms against you again? There's not a good answer to that question. Guantanamo Bay was, for better or for worse, the best thing that we could come up with. And I think that what you're all struggling with now is trying to figure out what is the best thing that you can come up with, and it's not that easy. So I think that the president and this administration is really confronting many of the same issues that we did. And to end on where uh, Lisa touched upon, all of these people are struggling in good faith with very, very difficult questions. And I I wish them the best. Well, hopefully we'll... We are, we are confronting a lot of these same yeah. issues, but and we also are coming out in, in different places oh, sure. on some of this. And Absolutely. I, <laughs> So, Ron, uh, you worked for two vice presidents. Uh, The Constitution gives the vice president virtually no duties or power. Uh, But you've worked for two people who obviously were had uh, tremendous power in the uh, in the context of a new administration. And uh, in between, we had another vice president who was an activist. Uh, in the role of the vice president. Um, So uh, maybe we can take this conversation and take it to to the question uh, from where you sit. How do you make the vice presidency relevant? Uh, And maybe as as importantly, how do you make it accountable? Are there lessons that, reflecting back through three administrations, that that you'd bring to bear on this a set of problems, and if you want to jump in with Lisa and Noel and get into the substance of those questions, feel free to do that too. Well, well, we did get rid of the man-sized safe, but um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, be, be, before I answer John's question, though, I have to say, just personally, I need to take a second just to uh, say, as Lisa did, how exciting it is to be here. I had the great honor uh, eight years ago in a small classroom at Georgetown Law Center being the first outside speaker to what was then the Madison Society uh, that is now ACS. And to see how far this group has come in eight years, it's uh, really just spectacular and wonderful to be here and be part of it. Um, uh, It's also exciting to be here tonight, uh, to be here uh, with with my friend John Podesta. Um, For those of you who are, share anywhere near the level of pride and joy I do over what the Obama administration has been able to accomplish in these first 125 days. An extraordinary amount of the credit for that goes to John and the transition he put together and the job he did on behalf of the President and Vice Um, President-elect. It's also great to be here with Lisa, given her contribution to ACS. But mostly, I just have to say, after my fifth ACS convention where I've spoken, after four times of debating administration officials, it is nice to be an administration (laughs) official. Um, You know, I I think uh, I have had the unique role of working for two vice presidents and a very interesting and different vice president in between. And I think with all of them, with all of them, the role of a vice president um, starts and ends with his relationship with the president and what the president asks him to do. Uh, Al Gore would have noted, as he often said, that uh, the vice president does have one other duty, which is to uh, cast a vote in the Senate uh, when there's a tie vote. And as Vice President Gore is fond of saying, every time I vote, we win. Um, 
But beyond the tie vote power, uh, it really does come down to the relationship with the president. And I think in the case of Vice President Biden, um, President Obama has really asked him to be a counselor at large, to give him advice on matters of domestic policy, foreign policy, to take on special projects as they come up. Uh, right now, we're spending a lot of time in the office implementing the Recovery Act and have a lot of our staff working on, on that. Uh, also, a lot on the foreign policy side of working on issues of nonproliferation and trying to implement the president's policy reviews in Iraq and Afghanistan. And this may, must be Vice President Cheney upset. Um, <laughs> Uh, implementing uh, the president's policy review, helping implement the president's policy review of Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iraq. Um, but I think that, uh, uh, but, but aside from these specific responsibilities, the general role of trying to advise, uh, provide advice and experience and, and some insights as the administration makes these decisions. And of course, in Vice President Biden's uh, case, also a lot of that is a 36 year track record in the United States Senate and a lot of relationships on Capitol Hill and working to try to help past the president's agenda by talking with his former colleagues and staying in close touch with them and trying to help move that agenda along. Uh, we have, though, faced the question of, of how to approach the vice presidency after Vice President Cheney's uh, controversial tenure in the office. And uh, you know, I think we've really focused on uh, a couple major things. The first is transparency. And uh, you know, it's, some of those things are small things. Uh, we do every night. I put out a, a guidance on where the vice president's going to be the next day. There are no undisclosed locations in Vice President Biden's office. Um, and some of the more larger things, the task force Vice President Biden chairs, the middle class task force, unlike uh, Vice President Cheney's energy task force, has all of its meetings in public. All of the meetings are on the record. Uh, uh, the outside groups who meet with us are all disclosed and posted on the White House blog. And so we make an effort to, be, to, be, to have a standard of transparency in the office that hopefully um, sets the right agenda and right tone. And, and the other is accountability. I think that you know, we, are, we are working very hard to make sure that the vice president's staff and the president's staff work well together, that they're part of an integrated whole and they serve a common agenda. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier, and I want to just take a second uh, more broadly to talk about relations with Congress. It's something the vice president spends a lot of time on given his history. And, uh, you know, people say it's, it is a very exciting time to be in the administration. It is an exciting time to be in Washington, exciting time to be in the executive branch. But I think it's also a very exciting time on Capitol Hill. And I don't think we should lose sight of that uh, either. This president has a very, very aggressive domestic agenda uh, that by necessity has to deal with many topics at the same time because of the situation our country finds itself in and is addressing those issues by working closely and energetically with the Congress. And I think it is that relationship and the progress we're seeing on Capitol Hill already with passage of the Recovery Act, the Ledbetter Bill, the Public Lands Bill, uh, the Tobacco Bill recently, that relationship and, and of course the big work ahead on health care and energy uh, and financial regulatory reform that I think really is the biggest change in Washington and the biggest change perhaps for the long run in terms of what's going to come out of the next uh, four years and, um, and the kinds of changes, substantial policy changes we're going to see for our country. So uh, it's great to be here at ACS. It's great to be part of the administration. Great to be working with our friends in Congress. And it's great to be bringing the change that I know many people in this room worked long and hard uh, to bring to Washington. So thanks. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, Preeti next and try to get my mic back. Um, you're the general counsel of the Office of Management and Budget. Probably a lot of people here don't know what that is, but Ron talked about the very aggressive uh, domestic agenda that the, pre that the president was, uh, has been undertaking. Uh, in this uh, administration, the Office of Management and Budget has become really a powerhouse across a range of questions, not just uh, putting together the federal budget, but your, uh, the uh, administrators, the uh, is very active on health care. He's uh, very active on climate and energy. As a U, regulatory reform, which is in your bailiwick. Uh, you have the CIO, which is uh, implementing transparency. They even did personnel, stealing the, stealing the portfolio from the Office of Personal uh, Management, uh, which was noted in the Washington Post today. Has, is this just a natural accretion of power into the executive office of the president? And, you know, you, you've worked uh, in state government, you've worked at the Justice Department. Is, is just more and more authority 
uh, by necessity now moving in uh, to, to that compound that, and that fence that surrounds the White House. And uh, what's your reflection on, on the way this OMB is uh, operating in, in the context of, of this very aggressive agenda that Ron talked about? Well, I think OMB um, in many administrations, but I think especially in this administration, is kind of an agent for institutionalizing change. I mean, we all believe in change. Change is a big word. Mm. I think OMB is kind of the implementation arm of presidential policy. I mean, you have an unbelievably hardworking, uh, visible set of creative policy people throughout the, throughout the White House, throughout the, the various agencies. Um, but you know, how do you, how do you get this high level, these high level policy thinking and high level policy pronouncements, how do you get them to move the permanent federal government? I mean, it's, it's a long process of turning, you know, a cruise ship around in some ways. And I think OMB, traditionally it's had, you know, it's 95% or so of its, of its employees, it's a cabinet level agency, it's a, a, within the executive office of the president. But 95% of its employees are career, only 5% are political. And OMB is in many ways the center of translating the president's priorities into administration policy. And it does that partly through the budget. Um, it does that through the regulatory reform process, uh, regulatory review process. It does that through all of the legislative clearance work. So whenever an agency has to um, speak to Congress, provide testimony for the administration to take a position on a bill, um, they have to speak with one voice. The administration has to speak with one voice. So that goes through OMB. There's a lot of levers by which OMB traditionally has um, played this role. I think in this particular administration, I think you know, this president is, is kind of famously known for being a little wonky, and in, in a good sense. I mean, he cares a lot about the nuances of, and details of policy implementation. He's somebody who really focuses on the details. I think OMB and the kind of the traditional sense of it as a bunch of, you know, policy wonks, nerds, kind of implementing policy, I think it's, it's a very important part of this, this president's vision of how do you actually get it done? How do you institutionalize change? I mean, don't just speak from on high, but actually make it happen. I mean, I think the Washington Post today talked about this uh, memorandum, you know, the, the, the OMB director sent out to all agency heads about uh, transforming the federal personnel process, the hiring process. Um, this is all about, this is the management side of OMB. This is about really making a difference and in, in transforming government. I mean, we're at this unique moment, I think, in, you know, in the public-private sector the boundaries of the public private sector as progressive we've often, progressives we've all believed in the power of government to solve human problems um, now we have the opportunity this rare opportunity to make government transparent effective efficient and i think omb is the center for a lot of those transparency efforts i think with the recovery act we work a lot with the vice president's office um, implementing a lot of the nuts and bolts of um, of, of the recovery act of spending um, you know, in four months, I tell people it's been four and a half months since this administration began, we've had two budget cycles, basically the 2009 omnibus and the 2010 budget, and a stimulus. And it's just been an extraordinary amount of work. And I think given the, the economic mess we're in, given just how presidential priorities are implemented through, through economics and budgets, I think it's natural that OMB would have kind of assumed this role at this particular time. And I think combined with that are some very powerful personalities and very effective people so far that have allowed for that to happen. Do, do, you, do you worry at all that, that, we're, that too much authority, too much power is being sucked into the White House? We are diminishing the roles of the cabinet secretaries, or do you think the balance is right now? Well, I think, I think that really is not so much about OMB. It's about the policy czars. And I think there's, there's talk of all of the various policy councils and their own policy czars within the White House. Um, I think it's, look, I mean, this is, a, this is a unique time. There's extraordinary challenges, and that need for coordination is something that's, that's, that's essential. So I, I think it's having a very, I mean, we see this with any, whether it's the NEC, the DPC, all of the various policy councils, or uh, CEQ, they're playing a, you know, a very creative role in bringing together all the good thinking around the administration. And I think given, given the ambition, the scope, the amount of work that's being taken on, it has to happen, I think, almost in that unified way. Kind of a yes, maybe. Yes. <laughs> Spencer, you work out there in one of those agencies right, way right, out there. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and uh, in an office probably uh, most people think of as actually doing uh, the work that Noel was suggesting, which is that you're sitting there deciding which, uh, te which uh, techniques can be used on prisoners. Right, but in right. fact, the Office of Legal Policy is not the Office of Legal Counsel. Right. Uh, but it does have an important role in the transparency questions that Preda was mentioning. Right. And that's been your background. 
There's been some disappointment on the progressive side in that arena too, on uh, state secrets, on uh, on the uh, question. There was just this case that uh, about withholding uh, Vice President Cheney's testimony to to uh, uh, to Patrick Fitzgerald that that was came uh, up as a as a FOIA question. Um, How did you assess the? Uh, b tell us a little bit about the role of the Office of Legal Policy in 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 sort of driving information policy in particular. And uh, how would you assess the new administration's uh, efforts to open up and make more transparent uh, the government for people? Okay. Well, just to start off, uh, and I'm sorry to repeat people, but I just have to say it is good to be here and see so many old friends. You know, I've been on some panels at past conventions, and that's been certainly an honor. But what I've really enjoyed is, you know, the time between the sessions when we get to have our one-on-one -on -one conversations and I've, there's so many friends uh, who are here and, you know, the relationships that we've uh, built over the, the short history of ACS. Uh, and as I've continued on, uh, many of you all have given me advice and insight and uh, support and I certainly appreciate it. Uh, you know, some of you are already a part of the administration. Uh, many of you will join it over the course of the next four or eight years. And I think if there's something I would say, it would be just please stay engaged. You know, uh, we need your ideas. We need your talent. We need your energy. Uh, you know, you really do uh, sustain us. So, you know, thank you all for just, just being here and, and continue. Uh, please continue to be engaged. Now. OLP is not as uh, high profile as, you know, these, these White House offices. So I, I thought I'd do a little uh, one-on-one in terms of OLP. You know, when I, when I was a professor, I'm on leave at, at George Washington University, you know, there'd be so many people who would say to me, oh, uh, how are things at Georgetown uh, uh, here, you know? <laughs> So, so now I'm in a situation where people say, you know, oh, you know, what's going on at OLC? You know, when are you guys going to release some more torture memos? Uh, that, that kind of thing. So if there's a nutshell description, it is OLC tells us what the law is. OLP tells us what the law should be, right? Uh, with OLC, OLC serves as an outside counsel to executive branch agencies. It serves essentially as the GC uh, at, uh, at DOJ, whereas OLP spearheads DOJ's legislative and, and policy initiatives. Now, we do some other things. You know, we vet judges uh, for the White House. Uh, we coordinate the rulemaking in the department. But, but in terms of policy, uh, in terms of legislation, policy, initiatives, uh, OLP is known as the, the think tank of the Justice Department. So uh, in the Reagan administration, for example, uh, they came up with the legislation which resulted in the current federal sentencing uh, system. Uh, they dealt a lot with uh, death penalty issues, uh, habeas issues, and, and really came forward with uh, an original meaning uh, jurisprudence. That's what OLP did in the Reagan administration. In the Clinton administration, uh, they spearheaded anti-terrorism legislation in the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, spearheaded the Violence Against Women Act and the, the Brady Bill. Uh, and in the Bush administration, the office uh, spearheaded, led, wrote, initiated uh, all of that, the, uh, the Patriot uh, Act. Um, so if there's something that is, uh, you know, Jen, you talked about state secrets, whistleblower. I think, uh, or I'm sorry, you talked about state secrets. Whistleblower is another issue we're, we're working on. I think if there's something unique about us is that we work with different components within DOJ and also different agencies around the government to really uh, balance out and work through, negotiate these institutional interests. You know, the criminal division at DOJ has different interests than the Civil Rights Division at, at DOJ, or a DEA, may, their primary focus is uh, preventing, let's say, trafficking of illegal drugs, whereas HHS 
They might focus on how do we make sure sick people have access to drugs. And because that framework, the focus is different, they're going to have different interests in how do we negotiate that to come up with the best policy. How do we become a, a neutral arbiter? So uh, certainly uh, there are some, some big issues uh, that are out there with regard to state secrets and, and some other issues, uh, and there really are uh, competing interests. You know, one thing that was fascinating to me, and maybe this is just because I was you know, a naive law professor, uh, was that you, know, you see the difference between Republicans and Democrats. And then maybe at a certain point, people could see a difference between um, uh, Senator Clinton and Senator Obama uh, during a primary. Uh, but, but really, when you deal with government, often there are differences between components uh, of the same administration, right? And how do you work through that? How do you negotiate through that so that you can come up with some coherent policy? So that's what you know we're trying to do in a variety of areas, uh, including those that you mentioned. Um, maybe I go back to both you and Preta. The, uh, th this is an administration that made a big commitment to transparency in the starting in the campaign and the transition into the administration. One thing that's not transparent is who's in charge, uh, and we've got a CTO, we got a CIO. The transparency uh, initiatives coming out of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. OMB has responsibility. Uh, the Justice Department has responsibility. Who should the uh, who should the public look to to hold responsible for open government in this administration? Well, well since Prita is much more in charge than I am, I'm going to defer <laughs> to her uh, initially on that question. <laughs> I, I think the answer is everyone's in charge of transparency and open government. I think this is something that's so uh, such a huge commitment of this administration that everybody has their hands in a piece of it. I mean, I think that naturally, probably the, the, the offices that are probably setting policy on that area uh, probably are OSTP, the Science and Technology Office, uh, which includes, which, which is where the Chief Technology Officer is housed, as well as OMB, because that's where the Chief Information Officer are housed. So I think those two offices are probably more involved than others in terms of setting the policy. But I think this is just something that's just cross-cutting every agency, every every office in, in the White House to be committed to. So I think it's probably going to come a little bit from everywhere. But, but I, th I think those two offices are probably you think, more. You think the project's going well? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the Recovery Act is a great example of it. I mean, we have, you know, we have the most unprecedented uh, level of transparency with regard to the spending of Recovery Act funds that so far has been out there. I mean, it's obviously a huge project to track Recovery Act dollars, but there are websites created for every federal agency. There's recovery.gov. There are state and local grantees that have their own websites. I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary effort. I mean, I think that where we've started, given where we came from, is, is, is huge. There's, that's not to say there's not a lot more that needs to happen. Have Twitter going in Iran recently? <laughs> Spencer? One, points I'd make. Um, first, I think a couple of very important concepts that are, are really, you know, kind of new in terms of a political culture would be transparency and collaboration. I mean, they're very consistent with, you know, technology uh, concepts. And I, I think that they do uh, characterize what is happening in terms of collaboration, whether it's uh, across agencies, departments. And then also in terms of transparency, when we talk about, you know, FOIA executive order, when we talk about the ethics executive order, uh, you know, this administration is, is really unprecedented in terms of the, the transparency uh, that it's, it's provided. No, you work for an administration that was proud of maybe going the other direction and, uh, and claiming uh, executive privilege and secrecy, and, and uh, the vice president, again, uh, was probably the, you know, at the vanguard of that. Um, do you see a big difference? Uh, obviously, I think the Obama administration is pushing off uh, Bush and particularly Vice President Cheney uh, in, in making uh, this big effort to, to, to connect with the public, be more transparent. But there's, a, there's politics in that as well. Sure. What, how do you uh, judge that? Uh, well, I, I imagine that there are differences, and the differences may or may not be bigger than we think once we start seeing more clashes between the branches. I think that uh, you all are right that when it comes to the kind of internal task forces, that the administration has set up, uh, you're more transparent, 
than the Bush administration was and then the, Cl and then the Clinton administration was prior to that. To me, the real fights about transparency that were teed up in our administration were the fights over executive privilege when it was pitting the Congress against the presidency. You don't normally see that when those fights when both parties hold the Congress and the White House. If, uh, you know, I hope at some <laughs> point, the, 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 the control of the, of, of the Congress and the presidency come to differ over the next few years, I think you are going to see those clashes. And that's when you're really going to see whether um, w the extent to which President Obama is committed to transparency. I happen to think there is an enormous value to being able to shield some of your highest advice from public scrutiny. If you really want the unvarnished, honest advice of your advisors, I think you're best off not splashing what that advice, what the advice they give you onto the front pages. I'll use a, a congressional example. I don't think that many members of Congress would want to have to make public the internal emails between them and their staff over whether to vote for a certain bill and what considerations they take in voting for a certain bill. Well, I think that's the type of non-transparency that we were really advocating in the Bush administration, namely that if you want the president to get unvarnished advice from his top advisors on very, very sensitive and controversial issues, that advice shouldn't have to be disclosed to the public because if it is, you're just not going to get uh, the best advice that you can from your advisors. So to answer your question, I really think it remains to be seen whether at the highest levels of where transparency is at issue, this administration is or is not going to be as transparent because they haven't had the types of fights yet uh, that, that, that we had once the government became divided in the Bush administration. Um, Lisa, you're, uh, by the way, let's, we have the cards and letters flowing in here if you want, if you want to ask questions. Uh, Lisa, uh, kind of like the Office of Legal Policy, no one knows what the staff secretary does. Uh, but, uh, so explain what your what your uh, main duty is, which is, you know, on the, on the paper flow side. And do you have a responsibility, uh, do you feel like you have a responsibility uh, to provide uh, alternative views from the right uh, to the president? He's kind of famous for wanting to hear from his critics as well as from uh, his supporters. How do you manage the need to give him uh, information that's coming uh, from, from the right? Uh, of course, all of us hope that you're only giving them stuff from the progressive perspective, but what, what, what's the role of, the, of, of your office in doing that? Um, the staff secretary's office, which is it's an office that I think most of us, I certainly didn't know about until working in the White House, um, is it's a very inward White House looking office in the sense that it's all the paper that goes to the president goes through the staff secretary's office. And I think the most the core of the job is ensuring that by the time a decision memo gets to the president, it accurately reflects his advisor's views. So it, you, you, there's a process that you go through as a, one of the policy councils is working on developing policy and is working with agencies on policy. It works its way through. There's a certain amount of consensus that's developed. What we do is we're sort of the last substantive stop before it gets to the president. So we will make sure that we'll circulate it, literally, and make sure that his senior advisors have all had a chance to have input so that if you have Larry Summers working away on something, it doesn't happen just in a silo so that Peter Orzag at OMB hasn't had a chance to weigh in because there are, ver there are serious differences of opinion on a variety of issues within the White House, and this is a president who actually really let, he wants to hear from his different advisors and he wants to make sure that he is, has the benefit of all these different opinions and so you can you can see that if you get if a policy just works through in a particular silo and gets to him he wouldn't have the benefit of that and you could have a decision that might not be wrong but it also you might come to think that to realize afterwards that it could have been better um, and so that's really the core part of the job and I'll end Often, it's with technology, actually. I was saying this to John earlier. One of the changes in the job is that our office actually gets, gets um, very substantively involved in going back to the authors often and saying, well, what about this? The president's likely to want to know about this. How about this issue? And, and that can be, as John's suggesting also, well, here's where you know, conservatives tend to, they, this is the argument they make. How do we respond to that? And so there's a lot of um, 
working with the offices to make sure that they really are teeing it up and that people are engaging um, on the particular issue. And the president also asks questions. And the other thing that happens is he, if there's this, it's not really, what I described um, was a little more linear than a decision often happens. There will be a meeting with the president about something. There will be an initial memo. It will come back from him with questions on it. And what about, you know, how about this? I want to know more about this. And you get people involved in that. Um, and it's also with the agencies. I mean, I think one person, one thing, John, when you were talking about earlier, the czars, I mean, you really do see it, the issues right now. The government has a tendency, the executive branch can become siloed, that, that every, people can become territorial if they want to about their agency and their turf. And the one thing with these very difficult economic issues, um, national security issues right now is you really do have to have somebody driving that coordination process. And that's, I think, a lot of what you see with the energy czar, with the health care czar, is somebody who's bringing all the agency players to the table and making sure that their views are considered, that they're part of the policymaking process, um, and that the president, therefore, gets the best advice that he can get. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, one of the places where I think progressives felt the perhaps the biggest change would follow from a conservative administration to a progressive administration is in the selection of judges. Uh, we now have a sense uh, with the selection of Judge Sotomayor to, the, uh, to be a Supreme Court justice of a little bit of an inkling about the way uh, the president is thinking about this. Uh, but Spencer, you're involved. Preeta, you were involved in the, uh, in, during the course of the transition. Ron, you were very active uh, in, in judicial selection uh, Lisa, I'm not sure whether you've been uh, participating as well. G get, why don't, take it in order, whoever wants to go first. What's his criteria? And I guess I'd ask another question, which is, why has it been so slow in, pro in producing Court of Appeals nominees to the vacancies on the Court of Appeals? Anybody want to take either well, one of those? I, I just want to make two quick points. My perspective is fairly limited because OLP largely focuses on vetting judges that the White House selects. So we, we support the White House through our, our vetting process. Um, but, but I will say that um, uh, the first Bush nominees were in May in terms of the Court of Appeals. And uh, the Obama administration has that beat by at least a couple of months, at least with regard to nomination. So I, I would just, you know, uh, from a kind of a factual uh, a point, say that, you know, nominations, actually the Obama administration is ahead of previous administrations. But in only, terms only of the Bush. two so far, right? Uh, I, that in term, yeah, okay. okay. But, but. <laughs> don't don't, don't, don't overclaim. <laughs> right, 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 right. Oh, two more today. So we're up to four. So it's right, getting better. Right. Th things are moving along, but I, I there, there were only a few uh, nominations that made it through in the Bush administration. And those were people like, I think, Roger Gregory or early on. Right. Most of the people, when we talk about confirmations, it was like September, that, that kind of thing, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, well, that's it on timing. So we, okay. now we, right. we're up to four. Now, what kind of people are going to be put on that court? Uh, a lot of people want uh, to, to kind of counterbalance and balance out <laughs> the very conservative judges that, particularly on the Court of Appeals, that that President Bush and, and previous Republican presidents have put on. What kind of attributes do you see President Obama looking for in selecting judges to the Courts of Appeals in particular? I can speak from the transition standpoint where John, you and I both worked on this. I mean, I think, I mean, it was clear that he was looking first and foremost for very capable, intellectually gifted uh, lawyers, jurists, pro law professors. I mean, it was just, that was first and foremost, the clear, clearly superior um, qualifications. Um, I think my sense of the kind of extra factor, that the distinguishing factor was more uh, just a sense that this was a person uh, who understood a little, who had a sense of why they wanted to be a judge. It wasn't just some pristine, you know, piece of paper, not just reading briefs, but really understood and had some interest in the human dimensions of judging, who, who wanted to understand, you know, who, who had some life experience dealing with people, I think, I think I had the sense that the president was not that interested in people or was more interested in people who actually had, um, you know, litigated real cases, worked with people, uh, it didn't have to be in the context of litigation, it could just be a public interest work, but I think somebody who really had a sense of the human dramas 
and the human stories behind a lot of the cases. So I, th that was the, always the, the extra factor. Ru Go ahead. Should jump in because he's been very closely involved in the Supreme Court nomination. But the, the word empathetic has come up a lot. And I think what the president, what he really does care about is that this is somebody who thinks about the impact of the law on these cases involve people. They are not just abstract legal questions when they come before the court. And that he thinks about, that these people have had the, a sort of real world experience that lets them that, and an approach where they think about the impact of the decisions they're making on people. And so it's not a, it's not a squishy, oh, I feel sorry for this person or something like that. It's about a very real world understanding about how is this case, how is this decision going to play out? What does it mean in the workplace? If, is it realistic to say that somebody should, should be able to complain about discrimination when she hasn't you've seen it enough in a paycheck over time to, to recognize that it's there? It's, it's a practical understanding of how these cases come up and what, what it actually means and how something's going to play out. Ron, you, you uh, selected a whole batch of judges uh, during the beginning of the uh, Clinton presidency. So, Some uh, of whom who are, are here tonight, in fact. <laughs> what, do, do you see any difference? And what, what do you think President Obama is looking for? You're well, I, th I think that uh, there's some similarities, some differences. I mean, I think with President Obama, and particularly I, I had the chance to work with him on his selection of Judge Sotomayor, you start off with someone who is a brilliant lawyer himself, who is a litigator himself, uh, himself who taught law, uh, and brings um, you know a tremendous amount of intellectual firepower and legal perspective to this decision. So, um, you know, this this was a, a choice in the case of Judge Sotomayor that he spent a lot of time on. He read a tremendous amount of material about her and a number of other possibilities. Had a very thoughtful and orderly process, uh, and in the end, you know, came away with the person he thought combined uh, great legal uh, acumen, great life experience, great practice experience, a diverse practice experience, both uh, as a private lawyer, a prosecutor, a trial court judge, an appellate court judge, um, perhaps the best rounded legal career once she's confirmed of any sitting member of the court. And uh, I think, that, I think that there was that whole combination of things uh, that the president was looking for in the case of Judge Sotomayor. And one other thing about the way he did this, President Obama is, as far as I know, the only president ever who spoke individually to every single member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, all the Democrats and all the Republicans, before he made this choice. And I don't know if that means more of them are likely to vote for his nominee or not, but I think the effort to reach out, listen to people, uh, understand what was on their minds, uh, uh, and factor that into his own decision-making, um, I, I think... Um, is a kind of approach to this that hopefully will 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 we'll set a better tone as we go forward in this process. Um, there's a, the, I'm, I'm trying to group the questions and and, and combine them, but because we have so many. But uh, there's a, a number of questions about the how that we're that the president's doing too much, but there's a decidedly a deep strain of questions that he's not doing enough in one particular area, uh, and that is. Uh, the, on the question of gay rights, uh, and uh, including marriage, adoption, medical insurance, uh, very uh, several questions about how you could have filed the DOMA brief that was recently filed uh, with respect to the case in California. Uh, uh, I don't know whether I, I'm directing this to the right person, but does anybody want to take that up? And, and, and I don't know whether, Spencer, it's come across your desk or... or uh, uh, Ron, you want to, to uh, uh, discuss what the what the administration's action is? Don't ask, don't tell. Uh, I throw it up to you. Jump uh, ball. I did work on the matter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, come on. Somebody's got to be brave here. <laughs> that it was an awful lot better than the brief that was written in the Bush administration. There is no question, personal statement, that there were some. Um, uh, Sites in there that should not that should not have been in there, but there were some. I think they they did make a concerted effort to be making arguments that um, in their in this position of having of defending right now. Um, of they they were trying to make it, make arguments and essentially eliminate arguments actually that the Bush administration has made. I think it's it is it, the administration is trying hard. It's moving slowly. They did you know announced yesterday. 
Um, he asked, um, issued a, pre a presidential memorandum um, extending benefits, um, the State Department's extending benefits to same-sex couples for um, travel benefits and health benefits. It's a complicated area of laws. I think a lot of people know we're constrained um, by DOMA, and so what he's trying, trying to do right now is do what he can do within the confines of DOMA and, and, extend, ben and extend those benefits, and then said very clearly that he wants to be working with Congress um, to both to first to support the Lieberman-Baldwin legislation, which would extend health care benefits to same-sex couples, and then also to repeal DOMA. It is, it, I, nobody thinks it's fast enough right now, um, but I, he, I know the president cares about this and is working on, and he's made clear he wants to reverse don't ask, don't tell. It's, it is going in the right direction, if not quickly enough. Ron? No. Uh, what she said. <laughs> no, uh, look, I, I understand why people are impatient with the pace of progress. Uh, I would say, in our defense, I think the progress has been mostly in the right direction, and it is a question of pace. Um, I under, again, I understand why people are impatient. We have only been here 125 days, and uh, and in those 125 days have many irons in the fire, but uh, but so so I guess I'm in the uh, you know I, I kind of share Lisa's view, which is I understand the frustration folks that care about these issues feel uh, because I care about these issues, the president cares about these issues, the vice president cares about these issues, uh, and I hope that you know next year when we have this conference uh, and that question gets asked, it doesn't elicit the same kind of applause. Uh, that it elicited this time, because I hope we have more progress, more things to show for, and hope that a kind of applause it elicits a year from now is applause about the accomplishments we've made and the progress we've made in the ensuing year. Um, I hope you're right. Um, uh, I, I'm just going to read this question. Most, uh, much of the administration's uh, political policy, as well as the legal agenda of many progressive groups, uh, seems to be strategically responsive to the success of the federal society legal agenda. What's the legal and, more importantly, constitutional foundation of the society uh, that you want rather than the one that you think that we can achieve? Uh, and how, could, how do we move that towards that society as opposed to simply away from uh, the, what the Bush years established? So really right in the heart of the of, uh, context of legal policy, where do you think where do you think we need to be going? <laughs> oh, this is a president. Has, you can, you can, as you watch how he approaches the enhanced interrogation techniques, um, the military commissions, those set of issues, this is somebody who, who um, when you listen, I don't know how many of you heard his speech at National Archives on this whole rubric of issues. He believes very deeply in this document, and he gets it. He understands how what, what it means for people in this country. And I think, be, like, as with his choice of a Supreme Court justice, um, because of who he is and where he comes from, you're going to see, um, you already see it sort of more a part of the fabric of a lot of the decision making that's happening in the administration. Um, and. I think we're, as we come into office, we've come in with you know, both some, a number of serious problems that we're having to react to, which is part of what leads to that question of it, it's, it's reactive on some, on some issues that have come up, and, and a very clear agenda on um, health care, education, the economy. But I think over time, hopefully we will see more um, of a movement. Um, Spencer, coming out of your office. That certainly is, is a hope. One thing that's interesting that I didn't appreciate, I think, before is just how much is reactive, you know, how much you have matters that are coming to you and how you have a finite period of time in a day and you got to figure out, okay, what do I have to do today and what has to get crossed off the list today and then what can I do tomorrow uh, kind of thing. And so uh, certainly... Uh, Thinking about this in terms of the big picture is important, but you know it's also important to react and deal with what's on your plate any given day. And I think that's something that I didn't have full appreciation for before before starting the job. Prita. Yeah, I think in terms of you know just judicial legal philosophy going forward, progressive. You know, so much of progressive legal doctrine, at least in my lifetime, has been set by uh, a sense of the courts as being levers of social change. And I think, you know, partly because I think President Obama has revitalized politics 
and partly because we now have two branches of government, or we have the executive branch as well. I think you know a lot of. I, I think there's going to have to be a lot more, you know, developed and continued developed thinking about the role of, of courts and politics and the intersection of democracy and you know turning more to using political processes and persuasion through politics as much as through the judicial realm. I think the other piece I would just add, you know, I, I'm. This feels to me, and maybe just because of where I am, this feels to me like such a unique and different time in terms of the modern regulatory state. I mean, we're at this kind of transformational moment, almost kind of like after the Civil War, after the New Deal period. Um, and I think we're seeing that in the, the restructuring a lot of of government on a, on a lot of different realms. And I think at some point that's that's going to have to start shaping our judicial philosophy going forward. I mean, I think, I, I was just reading again a while ago the, the Metaphysical Club, the Louis Manan book, about the kind of rise of pragmatism that came about after uh, the Civil War as a judicial philosophy. And I, I, I was just very struck by that and how it struck me as a similar moment now that a more maybe pragmatic judicial philosophy, a little less ideologically driven and more focused on just making government workable is something that uh, you know, courts can play a role in, in promoting. Ron, is there a, 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 again, I'm kind of combining some questions here, but is, is there a, a the, the president shown his, his, his desire and his ability uh, to, to be quite aggressive in using executive authority? And uh, some of that's been vested with the vice president in the, in the, task, in the middle class task force and the, in the work he's doing with respect to the recovery bill. Is there a danger in going too far in that? Is there, can, the, can we concentrate too much power in the, in the presidency? Or do you, you know, what, where do you think the limits of that are? Or would you say you're not even going far enough yet? Uh, and if the Congress can't get its act together, we're just going to have to you know, uh, bust through some of the problems that, that Preda was alluding to, I think. I think, um, as I said in my opening remarks, I do think that um, both because of the kinds of problems we face and because we have the first president and vice president who both came from the legislative branch since 1960, uh, you do have a president and vice president and administration very focused on working with Congress. And uh, I think our major policy initiatives, the economic policy initiatives, health policy, uh, energy policy, financial regulatory reform, um, education policy are all things that are going to be done in conjunction with Congress. And I, I, I think when you look at what the President did in his first 100 days uh, and the 25 days since then and hopefully the next 100 days after that, it, it is going to be a period of legislative output that probably is unmatched for any period other than uh, the New Deal. And um, uh, so, so I, I think that we take a backseat to no one in working with Congress and that is our primary focus. There are areas where the president can act on his own executive authority, and we are exploring those areas. Um, you know, we, we, the president has issued some executive orders, some of which reverse Bush policies, some of which are more affirmative in nature, and we continue to look at areas where he can act uh, to do that. But, but I would say the vast majority of our time and energy and focus are on these policy initiatives. We're working with Congress to try to bring about real change in, in health and the economy and energy and in education. Noel, are you an Article Two first person as well? Do you think the president, ought, you know, really ought to take the full sweep of uh, of the power that that he can exercise under the Constitution and just and push forward with it and under the statutes of the of the United States? Well, I think it, it, it depends on the circumstances. When you've got uh, a Congress that's of your party, there's really no reason why the president politically should put everything on his shoulders because if things go wrong, he also bears all the blame. That's the genius of our system. You've got one president, and when the president's actions are based solely on the president's decision, he alone bears the blame and he alone uh, reaps the glory. When you're in a position to be able to share it with another branch of, of the government and the Congress, it makes perfect sense to do that. That's what President Bush did uh, during the periods of time where he had a Congress that was of his party. Uh, and I am not at all surprised that, that that's exactly what President Obama is doing while he has a Congress of his own party. But I expect that there are going to be areas where President Obama, just like with President Bush, can't accomplish his policy goals working with Congress. A, a good example is the don't ask, don't tell policy. I'm not, I haven't taken the temperature of Congress. I don't know where a majority of it is. But if the Congress isn't where the president is, as I understand the law in that area, the president is commander of chiefs could change that policy fairly quickly if he wanted to. So at the end of the day, I think the president ought to be prepared to fully assert his power when he needs to, but you don't have to be stupid about it, and you shouldn't do it when you don't need to. 
Uh, does anybody want to take that particular case up? You guys are cowards. Come, Come on. on. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get a rise out of you all. <laughs> President prepared to do that if uh, if if it stalls in Congress. Okay, I can't get it. Can't get a rise out of this crowd. Um, uh, good question. Uh, often the conversations about about transparency is about uh, the administration communicating with the public and the public being able to see what the administration's doing. Uh, the question is, how does the public effectively communicate with the administration? How does a regular citizen or a member of ACS? make their policy concern or issue known to the administration. Lisa, you want to? Um, one of the goes, goes along with transparency. This it is an administration that's really using technology in ways that you have not seen before um, and has a very vibrant website and is, and is really encouraging um, interplay on the website. Um, so I think that that is obviously one way. The other way is sort of the is I think the traditional way, which is and especially for ACS members talking to all of us. I mean, this is there really we really do want to hear ideas. This is a, an administration that's very eager to hear good ideas right now. And so I think it's a I don't recommend regular mail to the White House because yeah. I just last week received an invitation um, to an inaugural party because. It, <laughs> <laughs> It was being irradiated someplace, um, but email and the, the through the website and talking to all of us. And I think um, also this White House's office of what used to be public, public liaison and now the office yep. of public engagement is a very very vibrant part of the White House. Not just in terms of meetings, but actually bringing feedback back and being involved in substantive policy. And they have, I mean, they have an email that actually it's something like public is it public at who.eop.gov, but Someone actually checks it every minute, so don't don't think it's just like one of these dummy mailboxes. And it's actually checked, and somebody processes that. It's a, it's a very vibrant operation, and I think the technology piece is going to even get more and more vibrant. It turns out for the for the folks that were coming from the campaign, there's all kinds of restrictions on federal government websites that didn't apply, and so those are being worked through. New new rules are being promulgated as they need to if they make sense. So there's there's a there's a process underway, and I think the the, the tech tools will only get better as as the year progresses. Um, what the uh, I think that the it, it may be fair to characterize this, and again, I'm sort of trying to pull a couple of questions together. That the Bush presidency ended up being consumed by Iraq and was really single-minded in its focus on the war on terror, if you if you want to call it that, but particularly the war in Iraq. Uh, and this president maybe is going in in, in somewhat the the opposite direction that. He's got health care, he's got education, he's got the budget, he's got financial re regulatory reform, he's got uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, uh, Middle East, uh, North Korea. Uh, is there a danger in, in the public kind of losing uh, uh, the I idea of what he's actually trying to do? Uh, uh, how do you balance bringing a transformative drive to policy policymaking with remaining in touch with people's concerns, people's preferences, and people's understanding about where, where this presidency is going. What the president is doing um, is he receives every night um, a dozen letters from people who have written to the office of the, to the office of presidential correspondence, and they're and they are and he reads them every night. He often he I've seen him put a note on and say to Tim Geithner, you know, is our program helping this person? Um, he is very. He is fighting the bubble in a way that I have not seen on in. I, mean, I don't know for with President Bush, but I think because of coming in as he did, um, he's really trying very hard to stay in touch with people and ha and what people are thinking. And that's just one it, sort of concrete way that he's doing it. You know, I think I think in terms of the agenda, um, you know, as the president is fond of saying, he really doesn't have a choice. I mean, uh, he can't uh, tell the economy to wait until he's fixed health care. He can't tell health care to wait until he's fixed the economy. He can't tell energy policy to wait until he's fixed the economy and health care. And he certainly can't tell financial regulatory reform to wait until he's fixed all these things. So you know, these are all problems that demand solutions, that demand solutions now. And, uh, you know, I think, I think the strategy 
is going to prove to be extremely successful. Obviously, the same thing with the global problems. We have two wars going on. Those can't be parked and told to wait. And same thing with Iran and North Korea. I will say that, um, you know, in the first year of the Clinton administration, I'm sure John will remember this, we spent an enormous amount of time uh, debating what order in which to attack different problems. Uh, long meetings about welfare before health care, health care before Rigo, Rigo before NAFTA, NAFTA before this. A and in the end, I felt, looking at it in retrospect, we spent more time fighting over the order in which we were going to approach problems than we really did in getting those problems solved. And, and sometimes we outfought ourselves a little bit in the sequencing game and, uh, and to our detriment. And so I think both out of necessity and I think out of a sense that uh, it's possible and in some ways even more effective, the president's attacking all these problems simultaneously and I think we'll have success on, on all of them or the vast majority of them uh, in, in bringing about change in all these areas. Uh, where, where do you see the biggest potential, biggest pitfall for, for uh, stalling in the, in the tremendous agenda that he's putting forward? Well, I, th I think right now... Yeah, a rough week on health care, for example, yeah, with the CBO but I think, I think, I think uh, you know, all these things uh, have a certain quality of perils of Pauline, mm -hmm. you know, the, the ominous music playing in the background, you know, and, and then finally, ultimately, a happy ending. And I think we will get to a happy ending on, on health care and energy. Um, I think regulatory reform also will come out good. These are problems the country needs to address. These are problems we need to solve. These are not optional exercises. These are not, you know, things we're tackling just because they're good sport or good fun. And I think that necessity of addressing them is going to ultimately compel action on them. Okay. Um, again, back to the cards. Uh, how can progressive activists who are lobbyists for workers' rights, environmental protection, universal health care, and the like persuade the administration to treat lobbyists no differently than other representatives and leaders of their organization when it comes to government employment and policy engagement. Can't we at least make a distinction between lobbyists for nonprofits and lobbyists for commercial interests? <laughs> Spencer, you want to go after that one? <laughs> you know, I uh, worked a bit on these issues during the transition. And, you know, it, it really was difficult. There are some issues that we struggled with. And it, it really came down to uh, it, it is very difficult to say, okay, these are the good lobbyists that one likes and these are the bad lobbyists and, you know, kind of let's get them out of here. The president made a commitment to really clean up Washington in terms of not focusing on special influence and special access, but really listening to all uh, Americans. And, uh, you know, he's just been very strong in his commitment. And, and certainly there has been some criticism uh, across corners, and I certainly understand. I certainly appreciate. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's a question, can I come back to ACS and, and give a talk? Or, you know, there, there are some, some things that seem to slow one down, but just the the prophylactic nature and the, the message to the American public that we're going to do things differently, that we're not going to have a closed door session with some executives from a particular agency or a particular industry that you know no one will have access to, that the public won't have access to. We're just making a, a sea change with regard to those issues. So uh, I understand that it's complex. I understand that there's some, you know, people who are really committed, who spent, devoted their life to public interest lobbying and some other issues. And, and I understand that uh, there are some difficult cases. But just in terms of the overall change of the administration and, and, and what we're doing with regard to ethics and what we're doing with regard to um, sending a message to the American people, you know, I, I think we're, we're in the right place and we're moving, we're moving in the right direction. Um, we're, we're basically about out of time. I'm going to, give, I'm going to uh, go down the line, maybe starting with you, Spencer. Uh, I would say that there is, uh, as I'm looking at all these questions, there's a s significant amount of skepticism about military tribunals uh, in, uh, in the crowd and a lot of questions about that. There's a couple of questions about 
uh, whether the administration's been too tepid in the support for EFTA. Uh, there is a lot of skepticism about uh, the continuation of the policy on state secrets, and there's more questions about that. Those are some of the things we talked about. But here's my favorite question that was uh, brought. And so I offer you a little bit of time just to close up, give some final thoughts, uh, and maybe reflect on this, which is my favorite question of the day, which is, what does the Obama presidency mean to you? <laughs> <laughs> so you take any of those topics. I'm sorry I didn't get, I mean, we had hundreds of questions here, so I'm sorry I didn't get to them. But if, you, if anybody wants to talk about EFCA, go back at military tribunals and why they're necessary. Talk about state secrets. Feel free, but why don't you answer that question? What does the Obama presidency mean to you? And, Noel, you're going to get to answer that, too. <laughs> um, I think it really does mean change. You know, there are some things that are, you know, government things and uh, components, uh, turf battles, all this kind of stuff. But I think it really does mean change, and I think it, uh, for me, it means the fact that there's so many people who are in this room who are going to have an opportunity to contribute and participate and, and in terms of government service. And I just really look at it as an opportunity for all of us. You know, whatever time we have is really finite in terms of making a difference, whether it's four, uh, eight years, maybe longer in, in terms of, I, I don't know. But it is finite. And for those of you who've been engaged in one way or another, uh, and you know you're maybe you're not part of the administration right now. What I just would say, please just stay engaged. Uh, we've got uh, a period of time. Uh, maintain the faith. Uh, continue to both pay attention and also uh, continue. You know this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. The days seem like sprints, but uh, you know we're gonna need you in September. Whether it's to accept a position or to do something. And so I would just encourage you all to uh, stay engaged, offer your talents, offer your uh, talents both in terms of uh, support volunteering, but then also uh, your service in terms of joining the administration. Please stay supportive and please stay engaged. I didn't get a chance when I, when I started to, to tell you how honored I am that you all invited me to be here today. And I am. I, I can remember about eight years ago uh, when we in the Federal Society gathered in this very room and how elated we were uh, that uh, uh, the president that we supported had just been elected and many of us had played uh, such a key role in that election. And, and I can only imagine the joy that you all feel now being in a similar position. And I congratulate you on that. Enjoy it. It's wonderful. And uh, unfortunately, it doesn't last forever. <laughs> uh, on the question, what does President Obama mean to me, that, that, it's a pretty easy one. Right now, uh, I spend my uh, livelihood representing tobacco companies, oil companies, <laughs> employers that have massive numbers of employees. So when I think, see things like legislation that uh, imposes FDA regulation on the tobacco companies, uh, emerging energy legislation that's going to impose massive regulation on the oil companies, <laughs> and uh, the EFCA, I'll even touch on the EFCA, massive regulation of employees and increased unions, I see enormous amounts of business. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's what the Obama presidency means to me. And and we're really happy to keep you in the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, seriously, I mean, to, if you look at what this administration has done in 125 days, whatever it has been now, I mean, from the signing of the Lilly Ledbetter Pay Act to banning torture to signing the st stem cells to S-chip to now tobacco regulation, I mean, that, th this is what it means. I mean, standing there it, it, with the president when he's signing these, you look at the, looking yesterday with him signing the memorandum on extending same-sex um, benefits to same-sex couples. I mean, people are in tears. There's a real pe people, all of us are really impacted by this. 
And that's what it means. It, this, is, this, is, this change is not abstract. It is, it is very, very real. And there will be a lot more of it. So it's, this, it's hard. These problems, especially in the national security arena, are, are, some of these are very, very difficult. And people of really good faith are trying, are, with a real belief in this Constitution, are working on them. And, and some of this is a, you know, help us. You know, give us your ideas and stay with us as we work through them. Oh, well, I appreciate Noel's candor, uh, though I'm not so sure about that whole elected thing eight years ago. Um, <laughs> so, not to use that word, <laughs> knowing the crowd I was in. Sorry. N not over it yet. Um, <laughs> ending Ron to Iran. No, 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 not over yet. Look, I, I do about think... about the 10th step yeah. of the 12th step. <laughs> I do think that um, uh, it's hard to add to the eloquent things that Spencer and Lisa said about what President Obama's presidency means. I, I, but, but I will say um, that, you know, to see... Uh, I, I think what this presidency means, yes, change, but change at a time when the nation so desperately needs the change. And I think it's the combination of the man, the agenda, and the moment that are so powerful for me and so moving for me and so why I'm willing to get up early in the morning and stay late at night and miss my kids and do all the things I do to serve um, because I think you have an extraordinary leader. I mean, just an extraordinary person in terms of judgment and talent and ability to lead the country. Uh, an agenda, a policy program that really can uh, put the country out of the cycle of boom and bust economically we've been on and, and out of the various problems we've had on the domestic front and international front and put us on the right footing at a time when we really couldn't need it anymore as a nation and as a world where, where the demand for this kind of change and action is so acute and so urgent. And I think when you put those three things together, I do believe we are at a historic moment and witnessing a historic presidency unfold. Uh, and uh, as Spencer said, uh, those of us who work on it every day are honored to be part of it. But that change won't be possible, and the success of the administration won't be possible without uh, its supporters its allies, its thinkers, its advocates who aren't part of the administration staying engaged, staying supportive, and offering that, th th those suggestions, ideas, and encouragement. So, uh, again, I think, you know, one thing um, we wondered, those of us who were involved in ACS early on, was what would happen to ACS if there ever were a progressive president? Would it remain relevant? Would it remain impactful? Would it remain important? And seeing the crowd here tonight and the crowd at this convention, uh, I'm so glad to see your answer is a resounding yes, and I hope it continues to be so for a long time to come. I, I think back to probably this time, June 07, a few months after President o Senator Obama at the time started running for president. What I see the possibility of this presidency being is transformational government in the same way that his campaign in many ways was transformational politics. I mean, I think his campaign brought politics a level of engagement and made, it, made politics relevant to ordinary people in a way I have not seen in my lifetime. And I've been really struck by whether it's the elections in India, the elections in Iran, to suddenly see this unbelievable engagement, this mass engagement, the use of technology, the, the kind of relevance of, of, of what I think is an Obama brand of politics spreading. Um, so I think of us as, as in the first stretch of that in terms of governance, kind of like we were at the beginning in early 07. I, I see the potential here of being not just incredible legislative achievements during the term of the president, of this particular president. And I'm excited about that, but it's not just about that. I see this as potentially catalyzing a change in our government for a time, for quite a while, long, long after President Obama's terms, terms are over. Um, I think, you know, 
we're seeing the graying of the federal workforce. We're seeing all kinds of changes in government. And this is a unique moment to really make government relevant to people's lives, uh, to solve problems, and, and that kind of pragmatic progressivism that I was talking about earlier. And I think if we can achieve that with government, what, what I think the campaign achieved with politics, which is relevance, um, engagement, and, and meaningful impact on ordinary people's lives, that will be a huge accomplishment. And I, that's what I think this means to me. Thank you, Priya. Um, I want to close by noting that one of the things I often say about the president that I don't get is that he holds no grudges. And I say that as a person who's half Italian and half Greek. It just like doesn't make any sense to me. I, but, I, uh, but I'm glad that Ron proved tonight that he's on my side of that divide. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, and also that he made room for think tanks in, in, the, in the constellation of, of, of the world. Um, look, I think that, as Prina noted, I think that um, the president has really just uh, changed, I think, the view of the United States around the world, and for that uh, we thank him. And uh, I think he's trying to do what he can to make a place at the table for every uh, single uh, person who lives in our country. Uh, and that is an exciting proposition, and it proves that uh, politics matters. Uh, and I want to close by saying I agree with one thing Noel said, that um, he ought to use his constitutional authority, and if the Congress can't get its act together on don't ask, don't tell, then he ought to just repeal it by executive order. So thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thank the panel. They were great. Uh, and now I know... Four of these people have to go back to work, but uh, but there's a there's a uh, a uh, reception that follows uh, in in the East Room. So uh, uh, please join the ACS staff and all the people who have been participating today in the East Room for a reception. Thank you. <laughs>